This is Christopher Cernike hosting episode 9 of season 3 of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins debate and host interviews with scientists. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today on Current Topics in Science, we have the honor of hosting Dr. Paul Nelson. Paul studied the philosophy of science and evolutionary biology at the University of Pittsburgh. After getting his BA, he continued to delve into these subjects, and it was at the University of Chicago that he got his PhD in the philosophy of biology and evolutionary theory. Presently, he is a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute an adjunct professor in the Master of Arts program in Science and Religion at Biola University. He's a member of the Society of Developmental Biology, the International Society for Complexity, Information, and Design, and the International Society for the History, Philosophy, and Social Studies of Biology. Paul has written numerous scholarly articles, and he's published in the Journal of Biology and Philosophy, Biocomplexity, Zygon Rhetoric and Public Affairs, Touchstone, Next Generation Systematics from the Cambridge University Press, Publication Education from the Michigan State University Press, Mere Creation, Signs of Intelligence, Intelligent Design and Its Critics from the MIT Press, and the Christian Research Journal. He's also one of the authors of a textbook called Explore Evolution, and he's appeared in several films on intelligent design and creation. He loves his beloved wife, and he's the proud father of two daughters. Now, without further ado, good morning, Paul. How was your day, and how are you doing? It's a beautiful, sunny day here in Chicago. I'm doing well, and I'm glad to be with you and your audience. Thank you so much, Paul. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. And now, since this is Current Topics in Science, we're going to quickly look at this week's current topic. There's an article called Sentinel-Based Analysis indicate that sequence divergence is not the main source of orphan genes. And to the author of that article, I hope I got the title right. The article abstract says, The origin of orphan genes, species-specific sequences that lack detectable homologs, has remained mysterious since the dawn of the genomic era. There are two dominant explanations for orphan genes. Complete sequence divergence from ancestral genes, such that homologs are not readily detectable, and de novo emergence from ancestral non-genic sequences such that homologs genuinely do not exist. Dr. Nelson, what is this article talking about, and what are orphan genes? Well, let me uh, start with a definition of orphan genes, just to get that on the table. Uh, Orphan genes are defined as sequences of DNA, and I'll talk mostly today about protein coding sequences, although I noticed that one of your questions coming up later deals with the work of uh, Nathan Lentz, uh, who's looking at what are called microRNAs, but we'll get to that later. So uh, these are sequences of DNA that appear to code for protein. And uh, you can think of them on a model with natural language, like English. So this is my... uh, daily desk dictionary here, the Random House College Dictionary. And uh, I can imagine myself reading a text in English and running across a word that I've never seen before. Okay, so the natural thing to do is either go to dictionary.com or I'm old school, so I pull this off the shelf and I look for the corresponding character string uh, to match that word that's clearly there in an English text that I've not seen before. Uh, In a parallel sense, we do this in genomics and genetics. Uh, We sequence DNA from a species and there are gene finding programs, gene finding software that identify sequences that look like they code for protein. They have characteristic molecular features that tell us this 
sequence of DNA probably is coding for a protein. Then we take those sequences and we submit them to databases like GenBank, uh, which is paid for by US tax dollars, or there's a corresponding database in Europe. Uh, and we look for the matches, right? Uh, the software, the pattern matching software aligns the sequences and says, is there a sequence in the genetic dictionary, so to speak, that matches the one that we've identified in this newly sequenced DNA? Orphan genes, as their name uh, clearly implies, don't have matches. So uh, there's a search tool or, or a matching algorithm called BLAST, Basic Local Alignment Search Tool, that you, you can submit your DNA sequence and BLAST will go and look in the database for a match using certain criteria for what's called being a homolog or an ortholog. And if no sequence turns up, BLAST will tell you no significant similarity found. That then is a candidate orphan. Uh, and, you know, in English, an orphan is a child without parents. So this gene sequence appears to have no molecular kin uh, out there in the database. Now, orphan is always a provisional designation because as we sequence more and more DNA, uh, looking at a greater range of species, we may find matches and then that sequence would cease to be an orphan, which by the strictest definition is a species specific DNA coding, uh, or excuse me, protein coding DNA sequence. So that's a gives you a general sense of what an orphan is. And if you use the model of natural language, uh, it's actually a pretty good parallel for getting uh, 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 access to this, to this notion. Now, the article that you cited is really interesting because what the authors did uh, is they looked at two hypotheses for the origin of orphans. So orphans are an evolutionary puzzle. They're an evolutionary puzzle because according to standard theory, all life on earth derives from the last universal common ancestor, our ultimate grandmother, if you will, that lived you know, over 3.5 to, to 3.8 billion years ago on the planet. And her molecular hardware, the proteins that go into making up the ribosome or the proteins that go into making up a DNA polymerase or an RNA polymerase, these essential molecular machines, her molecular hardware was copied by all of her offspring. And as you climb up into the branches of the tree of life, the evolutionary expectation is any protein and its DNA sequence should have been copied from a previously existing sequence, working our way back down through the tree of life to the last universal common ancestor. So the discovery of orphan genes, which is now, a, a, well, mid nineties, it's going to be approaching its 30th birthday soon. Uh, these were unexpected because evolutionary theory kind of gave the background framework uh, for genomics. And the view was all of proteins on planet earth, all of the genes coding for them derive from the last universal common ancestor. We didn't expect to find a lot of genes without molecular kin. So that's the, that's the puzzle. And the hypotheses that that paper is looking at are two. One is that what's happened with orphans is they do have molecular parents but they've diverged so radically from their molecular parents that any signal of history is lost. So again, a parallel to natural language in this case is helpful. The spelling of English words changes over time. So if you go back to Shakespeare, uh, to the first folio, right? The initial publication of his major plays, you will find spellings of English words that are no longer in the dictionary, right? Uh, one thing that dictionaries did when they were published is they stabilized spelling. So you go back to Shakespeare and you go prior to Shakespeare, go back, let's say, to um, Chaucer. 
you're going to have a hard time as a reader of 21st century English identifying a lot of the words in Chaucer, even though they are recognizably in the English language, because in, you know, Chaucer in the original, the spellings are, you know, strikingly different from what we use today. So as an English word moves through time, its spelling will change. Now we can track this if we have enough samples of English going back to Chaucer or even before Chaucer, we can track how the spelling changes. But if you didn't have those samples of English text running through centuries and you just had the endpoints, right? So the word as it's spelled today and the word as it was spelled for Chaucer, you might not be able to make that identification and you'd say, well, I just don't know what that word means. It's, it's too different. So you have sequence divergence happening to English words through time. Well, in a strongly parallel way, one of the hypotheses for the origin of orphan genes is as these sequences are moving through time, they're diverging so radically that the signal of history is lost. And the sequence as we observe it today looks like it's an orphan. In other words, it has no molecular parents even though if we could trace it, we could find it. So that's one hypothesis. The other one is more radical. And it says there never was a coding sequence that was the parent of the one that we see today. In other words, the sequence we see today emerged what's called de novo from non-coding, otherwise apparently random DNA. In an overnight step, more or less instantaneously, a novel protein coding sequence emerged. Now, what's radical about this hypothesis is prior to the discovery of orphans, and their, their discovery dates from about 1995, 1996, with the very first sequences that were determined. Uh, that is the very first genomes that were mapped, orphans were present. Nobody expected them because the antecedent probability that you could get a functional protein directly from non-coding DNA, otherwise random DNA, was, was thought to be effectively zero. And what's happened in evolutionary theory when orphan genes were discovered is a 180 degree shift in opinion about the probability of the formation of functional proteins from otherwise random DNA. I, I lived through this. So uh, I was getting very close to the end of my PhD when orphans were discovered. And I was able to observe in real time the change of opinion about the, form, the, the process by which novel proteins are formed. Orphans shook up the field in a remarkable way that's ongoing today, people are still, as the paper indicates in its opening sentence of the abstract, the origin of orphans is a big mystery for evolution. So I tell students, and I'm sorry I've gone on and on, but this is such an exciting topic. I tell students, uh, you know, if you want an interesting and exciting area in science to work, biology is in its golden age because it has this ocean of data awaiting analysis and interpretation. Uh, and I think we've got physics beat by a mile in terms of interesting problems to work on. And orphans are right there in the center of the puzzle. Paul, that is absolutely amazing. And I'm very grateful that you gave that very thorough explanation in a way that was clear, concise, and it made perfect sense. I'm perfect not sense. sure it was concise, but I hope it was clear. <laughs> it was very clear. It was excellent. I Actually, I learned quite a lot. This is not a subject that I'm really familiar with. I didn't, uh, biology wasn't what I majored in. And so this is just very interesting to learn. So what I'm gathering from what you're saying is it, it sounds like these orphan genes, they're becoming more and more relevant as new discoveries in science come out. So they become the major topic that they are now in Origins. Actually, speaking of Origins, you were on a show called Origins on the Cornerstone Television Network. There was an episode you did called Orphan Genes Puzzle. You said orphan genes and similar puzzles have caused Darwin's tree to be uprooted. Paul, what did you mean by that? Are orphan genes evidence against the evolutionary theory? What is Darwin's tree? 
So as I indicated in my answer, my long-winded answer to the previous question, the standard theory, and by that I mean what you would get in a good textbook on evolution or biology, is that all life on planet Earth finds its place in, in one great branching tree that's rooted in the hypothetical entity known as the last universal common ancestor. So think about it this way. If I said to you, uh, Chris, you know, tell me about your family history and think of it as a big set, the set of ancestors of Chris. And you'd say, well, my parents and then my grandparents and my great grandparents, and you'd start working your way backwards. According to standard evolutionary theory, we pass through the complete lineage of Homo sapiens. And at some point, it looks like you have a Northern European background. At some point, you and I are going to intersect not very far back in human history. We are going to have kin in common. Uh, and, you know, it's one big family, right? Working our way back to, according to evolution, to hominid populations in East Africa a few million years ago. And as that set of ancestors gets bigger and bigger, and we work our way back down through time, eventually, in your set of ancestors will be LUCA, L-U-C-A. That's the acronym that stands for Last Universal Common Ancestor. She, I can use the feminine pronoun here, she will be your ultimate grandmother, all right? Now, that will be true for any organism on the planet. When we look at its set of ancestors, we'll find Luca there. So if you approach biological data, uh, like genomic data, DNA sequences, with that geometry in the back of your mind, uh, you will expect that as you work your way down through the tree, the, the set of genes and proteins that you're looking at is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until you arrive at the set that was present in LUCA. The problem with orphans is we are discovering, biology is discovering that the number of unique sequences on the planet does not get smaller. It's going the opposite direction. So every time a new genome is sequenced, and now in a way that's really amazing to me, DNA sequencing is becoming so rapid and inexpensive that high school AP biology classes will be able to do it. In fact, uh, I have an acquaintance who works with Oxford Nanopore, which is a company in the UK that makes sequencers that are about the size of this little green box. They're called min-ions. You can plug them into your laptop with a USB 3.0 cable, and it's desktop prep. You can, you can prepare the sample and do DNA sequencing yourself. So it's becoming very inexpensive and rapid. And we're, we have this ocean of genomic data, and in each genome examined, there are sequences that we haven't seen before. Well, if you, if you do the calculation, what you realize is, uh, and again, I'll make a parallel to English. If I gave you the job of writing me an English dictionary, not like this one, but like the Oxford English Dictionary, which I have on the shelf over there, Initially, your sampling curve would rise very steeply. You'd say to me, I give you, you know, unlimited funds and a whole staff. And you say, I, I'm finding a whole lot of words I haven't seen before. But eventually, your sampling curve will flatten out. And you'll say, We've, we now have a good, adequate sample of the English language. There just aren't any more new words to find. Now, of course, the Oxford English Dictionary is updated annually because new words do come into English. But if you look at the new words that are formed, they tend to be formed from previously existing words. So I'm old enough to remember when ripoff entered the English language in the late 1960s, okay? It was a slang term, and we know what it means, right? Well, rip and off already were there. And it's a, it's a conjunction of two previously existing English words, or hip-hop, right? That kind of music. Hip and hop, again, a conjunction of, of previously existing English words. It's very rare 
for an entirely novel word, right, to enter the English language without antecedents. Anyway, the point is your sampling curve will rise very steeply, then it will flatten out, and there'll be little bumps along the way, but basically you'll say that dictionary is done. This is a, this is a good dictionary of English. Well, with genetics, what we're finding is the sampling curve is not flattening. It's going off at a steadily rising slope, meaning that we don't know the outer edge of the genetic diversity of life on this planet. And in a single liter of seawater, there are billions of viral particles. Every virus we examine has genes we haven't seen before. So the bottom line is the genetic diversity of life on Earth is vastly greater than anyone realized. To run the problem back to your original question now, the reason this is a challenge for the tree of life is all of that genetic diversity has to be derived from a singularity, let's say 3.8 billion years ago. And it, I think it's entirely possible that the genetic diversity on planet Earth cannot be derived from a singularity. In fact, there are scientists now completely unrelated <coughs> to the intelligent design controversy who are saying that viruses, for instance, must have had multiple independent starting points because their sequence diversity is too great. Uh, so uh, what's happening, I think, is this geometry deriving all of life on Earth from LUCA is being pushed to the breaking point by the actual genetic diversity that we observe. Uh, so in that show that you saw where I talked about orphan genes, that is the crisis, right? And with each new genome, the crisis gets worse. Paul, that is absolutely incredible. So I just, just want to make sure I'm understanding you. So it sounds like what you're saying is, is that all of this new data you know, like I like how you use the illustration. Even just one liter of seawater has all these viruses, and each of them have all of this genetic data in them. This right now, it's something that is it's almost like unaccountable for in the evolutionary paradigm or theory. I think that uh, uh, another parallel that one can think about is uh, what happened in the uh, early decades of the 20th century when there was an active debate in astronomy about in, in observational astronomy about the size of the physical universe. So in 1920, there was a debate between the astronomer Harlow Shapley from Harvard and another astronomer, uh, Curtis, over the size of the physical universe. At the time, Shapley defended a kind of standard view that the dimensions of the universe were about 300,000 light years across. And these funny nebula that we observed were clouds in the immediate vicinity of the Milky Way. So basically the universe was the Milky Way plus a few other anomalous objects in its immediate neighborhood. And what happened was, to simplify a rather complicated story, uh, Hubble, began to use the 100-inch reflector at Mount Wilson, and he turned that instrument onto that funny little cloud. That's actually nebula, I believe, means cloud in Greek. It wasn't a cloud at all. It was Andromeda, right? And he was able to detect in Andromeda variable stars that, that told him that Andromeda was not close, Andromeda was actually far away, and it was a sort of island universe of its own with billions of stars. And in short, the physical dimensions of the universe were vastly greater than 300,000 light years across. So I think what's happened and what's happening on a daily basis right now with genomics is the technology of DNA sequencing has enabled us to look at the actual genetic universe in a way that we, we could not possibly have anticipated prior to the mid 90s. So the technology has enabled us to get a much better glimpse of what's out there. And uh, the consequences are still unfolding <coughs> because 
the actual diversity uh, was much greater than anyone anticipated. And uh, I think, as I said a moment ago, I think it's made biology really incredibly exciting uh, uh, as a science. That's really incredible, Paul. And I just wanted to acknowledge right now, I mean, we're talking about different problems for the evolutionary theory. We're not trying to in any way say evolutionists are these unintelligent morons or nothing like that. They're very intelligent people. And when I was doing research for your presentation, I was wondering if I could find any maybe evolutionary explanations for orphan genes. And I ended up actually finding another one of your articles where you mentioned Dr. Nathan Lentz. He did a talk on orphan genes... And he called them, in his talk, he called them taxonomically restricted genes. He said that you would be interested in what he, Dr. Lentz, discovered, and in particular, the proposed evolutionary mechanisms he offers to explain their origin. Paul, what do you think of Dr. Lentz's uh, evolutionary explanation for orphan genes, or any other evolutionary explanations that you may have heard of? So, uh, Dr. Lentz uh, has begun to look at orphan genes in the human genome. And it's important to note that what he's looking at uh, and what he's discovered, uh, this, these results, by the way, have yet to be published, but if anyone's interested, if they go to YouTube and Google his name, Nathan Lentz, L-E-N-T-S, uh, in a talk he gave, I think now, maybe a couple of months ago, they can watch the talk for themselves. He is not looking at protein coding sequences. So I've been talking so far about protein coding DNA sequences. He's looking, in fact, at what are known as microRNAs. So uh, these are relatively short sequences that code for RNAs that fold up in interesting ways that are involved in regulating the expression of DNA. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and what he's doing is he's comparing the human genome and the chimp genome. So we've got two more or less complete genomes here. And he's taking, I think he's looking at chromosome 23, if I remember correctly. Don't quote me on that. Go to the talk. I'm pretty sure it's chromosome 23. And uh, he's aligning the human genome, so my left hand here, <coughs> with the chimp genome in the region of chromosome 23 and looking at areas that were thought to be what is known as gene deserts, all right? So when you look at the standard alignment for that region of those two chromosomes, so the chimp and the human chromosome 23 are thought to be homologous, derived from a common ancestor. So he's looking at regions where there don't seem to be very many protein coding sequences. And what he found is that the human genome has many, many microRNAs that don't correspond to anything in the chimp genome. Uh, and again, I want to make an analogy again to natural language, to English. So suppose I gave you uh, two sentences in English, and I'll just recite them and listen carefully. My, this German chocolate cake is delicious, said the fat sheriff sincerely. Okay, that's sentence one. Sentence two, my, this German chocolate cake is delicious, said the fat sheriff sarcastically. All right, those two sentences are identical except for the adverb at the end. In the first case, it's sincerely. In the second case, it's sarcastically, all right? If you do the statistics for those sentences, they look highly similar, right? Most of the words, as you read down the sentences, are identical, yet their meanings are exactly opposite. And we know that, right? Sincerely, as an adverb, does not mean the same thing as sarcastically. So, Let's go back to the chimp and human genome. Hum, human and chimp DNA is highly similar. It's remarkable how similar it is. There are many proteins in us that are 100% identical to those in chimps, amino acid by amino acid. 
yet no chimps are watching this podcast, right? When you see a chimp on television, he or she will always be wearing a diaper because chimps, like other primates, except for homo sapiens, when they have the urge to go, they just go, right? You'll have much better luck house training a pig, a dog, or a cat, right? An adult male chimp, fully grown adult male chimp, can tear your arm off. They are so strong, right? So uh, as, as organisms, we are remarkably different. Even though at the genetic level, we are remarkably similar. So why, why do I mention these two sentences and what relevance do they have to Nathan Lent's work? What I think Nathan may be discovering are those unique sequences in Homo sapiens that make us what we are, okay? And they may be only a small part of our genomes, respectively. But just as I described with the two sentences, sincerely versus sarcastically totally change the meaning of those sentences, even though, you know, word by word, letter by letter, they're like over 90% identical. You get to the adverb position and the meaning changes completely. So the, the organismal differences between chimps and humans that, that you know, <laughs> entail that a chimp has to wear a diaper when a chimp is on TV or, you know, when I go to the zoo, it's always the chimps in the enclosure and the humans looking at them. There, you know, there are organismal differences between us at the species level that are quite striking. Maybe those are partially encoded in the unique sequences that we find only in Homo sapiens. So the bottom line is, uh, <clears throat> I think Nathan may be onto something. He's beginning from an evolutionary framework. But the world is what it is, right? You go out and look, and if you give the natural world half a chance, it will talk back to you, okay? So the natural world is talking back to Professor Lentz. And I told him in an email exchange after his talk, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I said, I'm really interested to see, you know, the publication of these results. <coughs> uh, uh, he, he told me he's been through a, a bit of a rough patch in, in New York where he lives. His, uh, he has had to homeschool uh, his family and he got COVID. So he's been delayed in publishing the results, but I'm looking forward to them. And the funny thing about evolution as a theory is even though I think it's wrong in its major details, because it forces you to go out and look at the world you can use it instrumentally and the world will talk back to you. And as a result, you end up learning things. So uh, much of the research that I do is involved in taking evolutionary approaches and trying to understand them from a design framework as I have just now with my silly analogy about fat sheriffs and German chocolate cake, right? It may be that what makes Homo sapiens unique is just a tiny part of our genome, but it's absolutely critical. Does that make sense? I hope so. <laughs> that made a lot of sense. That was really incredible. And so from what I'm gathering uh, from what you're saying is that, you know, we have, because I've heard different figures, like I've heard some people say, oh, it's 98% similar. And then the number, I've heard different people give higher, lower estimations but you're saying is the differences are unimaginably critical. What, what I'm saying is if, and I'm quoting a, a evolutionary theorist from the University of North Carolina, Jonathan Marks, uh, in a wonderful paper about 10 years ago, he said, it's not that hard to tell the difference between a chimp and a human. The human is the one who is praying, playing sports, building houses, driving cars, uh, doing lots of things that are unique to Homo sapiens. And he goes on to say, if the genetic comparison tells you that, you're, that you are effectively a chimp and the biological comparison tells you you're not a chimp, the genetic comparison is misleading you, right? 
So I'll go back to my my parallel with uh, with the two sentences about the fat sheriff. It's critical that you get to that adverb and uh, analyze its meaning, because you can't take a sentence that that ends with sincerely and lift it and put it into a story where the sentence needs to end sarcastically, right? Because the sentence is going to occur in a higher level context that has to make sense. And because the meanings of those sentences are critically determined by a few letters in an adverb, that's where you need to focus your attention. So the, what I've said to students is evolution is not primarily a theory of similarity. Linnaeus, a creationist, knew all about similarity. Cuvier, also a creationist, knew all about similarity. What they said was similarity is misleading as a guide to transformation. Evolution is primarily a theory of transformation. So. When I look at an evolutionary analysis, what I want to see is what is the mechanism of transformation that will go from an unknown common ancestor to a chimp here and Homo sapiens over here. And that mechanism of transformation, I think, is what evolution currently lacks. So similarity can grab you by the nose and lead you around in all kinds of misleading ways. And I, I want evolutionary theory to focus on its main claim, which is that these transformations are possible. And that's what I personally am skeptical of. That's really incredible the way you... So I, one thing that you mentioned in the um, sort of the last question before I did that sort of follow-up is that uh, the evolutionary theory, it actually can prompt you in many ways to go in directions and examine things that maybe you might not have otherwise done. Uh, this is also kind of like the opposite side of the coin from something that you mentioned here on an episode of ID the Future. It was called Freeing Minds Trapped in the Naturalistic Parabola. And the description of the episode reads, That parabola sets the rule and defines the boundaries for science, naturalistic answers only, and it extends to infinity. So no finite number of objections or counter-objections can force naturalistic scientists out of it. So, Paul, can we use the evidence that you've presented here today about the orphan genes to help sort of free people from this naturalistic parabola? It sounds like you're saying it does have its uses, but here at the same time you're also warning, well, you want to make sure you're being cautious about this and not taking it too far. Is there another strategy? How can we sort of help people escape from, as you called it, the trap or the parabola of naturalism? You know, um, I'm glad you brought this up because I separate evolutionary theory as a scientific idea from the philosophy of naturalism. So the philosophy of naturalism is restrictive in the following sense. It says, when you have a puzzle in nature that you want to understand, you have to look for the natural, and that by that adjective, it means non-intelligent, no, no agent with a purpose, no, uh, no agent with a goal, no mind. Those kinds of causes are excluded, and it's not that they're excluded provisionally, right? They're excluded altogether. So... A good way to think about this is, is on the model of, of uh, a criminal detective, someone working for a police department, let's say. And he is told any death that you investigate must be explained in terms of so-called natural processes or natural causes. Uh, so he goes to a murder scene. Well, let's not beg the question and call it a murder scene. He goes to... The, uh, the scene of a death, <clears throat> and there's someone there with a knife in the center of his back, right? A great deal of blood. Sorry for the gory description, but it's necessary for the analogy. It's a great deal of blood everywhere. The guy's room temperature, right? He's stone cold dead. The knife is in the middle of his back, and the detective is told, You must find the natural cause for this death. 
the detective says, you know, I don't know. It's very hard to get a knife in the center of one's own back deep enough to kill yourself. <clears throat> People say that. That's it. Uh, imagine that world versus a world where the detective says, I will consider the range of possible natural causes, but if the evidence warrants, I'm going to infer homicide, right? Some other agent killed this poor guy, and that's what the evidence appears to indicate, and that's the avenue I'll find. So the problem with the philosophy of naturalism is it is it artificially restricts the range of possible causes that one is allowed to consider for any puzzle. That's not something that can be overturned by evidence. Because by its very nature, it tells you what counts as evidence. So if I come to a puzzle like the origin of life, or to a puzzle like the origin of animal body plans, naturalism as a philosophy tells me you have you are restricted if you think of it in terms of a toolkit to the 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 explanatory tools that come ultimately from physics bottom up from physical causation bottom up no agency no intelligence no mind is allowed and in the article that you reference this naturalistic parabola idea what i have discovered in my own interactions with people who hold the philosophy of naturalism is ultimately there's no reasoning with them because they are committed at a at a foundational level at a base level to explaining everything in the universe in terms of physical causes only and it, they're they're trapped in that parabola right and if you you know what a parabola looks like the mathematical construct of a parabola its arms extend to infinity. There's no getting out of it once you're inside. And in a situation like that, I think the, the rational thing to do is not to continue to debate the issue. It's rather to say, you know what? You're inside the parabola. You're determined to stay there. I bid you farewell. I am not trapped in the parabola. I can consider other causes. And, uh, you know, there's a great scene at the end of C.S. Lewis's The Last Battle. It's the book seven of the Narnia series, where Aslan and the children come upon a circle of dwarves who are arguing amongst themselves. And the children say to Aslan, can't you do something? Can't you break through to them? Can't you get them to change their thinking and show them that they're trapped? And Aslan tells the children, the dwarves want to be there, <laughs> right? They refuse to listen to evidence. They refuse to change the way that they think. There's only so much that I can do. And when I'm in dialogue with a philosophical naturalist who says it's got to be physics-based, all right. He's made an ultimate commitment to that presupposition, and finally evidence itself fails. So in that article, I was trying to encourage people, don't try to do the impossible. And the best that, in a situation like that, the best that an intelligent design advocate can do is show that our theory works, that it's beautiful, that it's open-ended, that it considers all the evidence, Try to make intelligent design so attractive that the naturalist will surrender his a priori commitment himself. But, you know, it's in the nature of an ultimate commitment that you have to give it up, right? No one can force you. And even the evidence itself ultimately will fail if you, ha if you have that ultimate commitment. Um, I just don't want people to be frustrated and get in arguments that are not going anywhere. <laughs> anyway, you asked one more thing, and I'll stop with this, uh, and we can move to the next question. I think orphan genes are powerfully suggestive that something more is going on in the history of life than just copying what was there before. All right? So in a sense, you can think of evolution as make a copy of, of what was there before and tweak it a little bit and let's see how that works. 
well, maybe orphans are telling us there's a lot more to the diversity of life than just copying what was there before. And that, that kind of leads you away from a naturalistic framework to a framework in which design is much more important. But you have to let the evidence have a chance to talk back. That was really, really incredible, Paul. And to be quite honest, I sort of wish that I had had that advice about maybe a year or two ago. <laughs> anyway, so, but thank you so much for talking about how to kind of get inside the box or stay outside of the box. And naturalistic imagery, as you said, it's very powerful. And so for somebody who is just kind of nestled into it, uh, ultimately, like you said, the best thing you can do is just, you know, just make your case and then leave it where it is. That's well, as a, as a Christian, I take very seriously Jesus words in the gospels. Uh, he says, let the dead bury the dead right? There comes a point when you just have to move on. Uh, and your time is valuable. It's precious. Uh, and sometimes the healthiest thing to do is to recognize that certain debates are sterile. The, the, the two frameworks don't overlap meaningfully, and you just have to move on. Here's the great thing, though, about intelligent design. It has lots of great things, but one of the great things it has is we can use any natural process for which there is good evidence. So I think much of evolutionary biology since Darwin is perfectly sound, right? A lot of their methods, a lot of their modes of analysis are true and useful and belong in the toolkit of biology. So I feel like <clears throat> when I open a journal on evolution, a lot of that stuff is useful to me in understanding the world. And it's heartbreaking because there's an asymmetry there because they, by their own ground rules, if they're philosophical naturalists, they have no access to design, right? Even though I, as a design theorist, have all kinds of access to the evolutionary discoveries that are true and useful. Uh, all right, I want the best toolkit I can find. <laughs> I like that analogy. And that sort of reminds me of um, something that you said. You see, so I like how you pointed out there's like the utility of the evolutionary theory. There was a video that I found uh, from the Forum of Christian Leaders Online where you contrasted both the intelligent design and then the theory of evolution. So you acknowledged first that it is a very powerful, useful picture. You said, universal common descent is a powerful picture. But I think it's false because there are requirements to cross these spaces in form and cross these spaces in function that separate two different groups of animals, let's say, or even two different kinds of cells. Throughout the whole of biology, you see these discontinuities in form and function that have not been spanned by a plausible evolutionary mechanism. So, Paul, what exactly did you mean by this quote? What are those requirements to cross the spaces in form that constitute evidence against, say, common descent? So, uh, if you look at uh, the way that classifications are built, uh, so we are eukaryotes. Our cells have nuclei, almost all of them. Red blood cells do not. Uh, um, to make room for oxygen-carrying hemoglobin, they, they uh, eject their nuclei. Uh, there are, I guess, the really discontinuity is the word you used, and that really is the best word. You have <coughs> systems with fundamental differences <coughs> that uh, represent uh, a challenge to any kind of gradualistic mechanism of transformation. Uh, and we can observe this from the very bottom level. So in protein structure, you see discontinuities. And then as you climb up through the hierarchy of the organism, you see discontinuities in cell types, in tissues, in organ systems. Ultimately, if you're talking about animals and body plans, on up to behavior, right? So there are 
differences present at every stratum of biological organization that challenge evolution because evolution says, as I, as I uh, pointed out in answer to an earlier question, evolution says there's got to be a pathway of natural transformation starting from LUCA to every living thing on the planet. Uh, and we see systems where that doesn't seem to be possible. In other words, uh, the system has an integrity as a whole that, that allows for a certain amount of variation, but then there's a barrier that arises where the, the system actually tells you if you take away this part, I will cease to be. And those are often described typically as essential, essential elements of the system. Uh, so let me give you an example. In uh, all cells that have DNA, uh, in other words, really all free living cells on the planet use DNA to store information. The topology of DNA is a spiraling double helix, okay? A spiraling double helix has topological problems that, are, that arise from that, that three-dimensional structure. Those have to be handled by specialized enzymes that you can think of as disentanglers. These are called topoisomerases. And uh, these proteins are essential in all cells that we know because all cells that we know have DNA. The spiraling double helix geometry of DNA means that as it's being processed, it supercoils, it forms. I, I can't, well, maybe I can. Here's my old school office phone. See that cord? All right, that's a spiral. If I don't disconnect the phone from the handset on a regular basis, the super coiling in the cord coils on itself and I get these big knots, right? So periodically I have to disconnect the, the handset from the base, let out the super coiling and relax the cord so it's functional, all right? Now, topoisomerases are essential. If you don't have them and you have DNA, you will die. In a, in a species of prokaryote called Methanopyrus, it has a topoisomerase that's found nowhere else, as far as we know, on the planet. It's, it's called topoisomerase 5, Roman numeral 5. It's essential, yet that protein is doing a job that it doesn't do in any other species. So this is an orphan by the standard definition of orphan, but it's also essential. So one of the things that's been discovered over the past 20 years by genomics is the presence of taxonomically restricted essential proteins throughout life. Why is this a problem? Well, how did that topoisomerase A, come to be in the first place, and B, take up the this essential role in that Archean, my Methanopyrus, um, in a way that no other living thing does. So this pattern is quite general, and it's led of, of essential hardware that's not shared, okay? These are discontinuities in organismal space. Uh, it's this this uh, uh, pattern actually has a long name. It's called non-orthologous gene displacement, N-O-G-D. <coughs> Big, long, kludgy name. But um, I could give you a good analogy. If you thought about the motherboard of your laptop, so let's say you have a MacBook and, and somebody else has a, 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 an HP laptop and somebody else has a different laptop and you look at the motherboard, you look at the CPU, the, you know, the, sort of the, the main working part of the information processing system, and your CPUs are built on completely different architectures. So you look at the CPU at the microscopic level, and the way those chips are arranged 
is completely different from the MacBook CPU to the CPU in the HP and so forth. Now we know that's not the case, right? We know that CPUs tend to be built on the same architecture from one system to the next, but we can imagine that they would, wouldn't be. In biology, we see these kinds of, <coughs> excuse me, fundamental differences right through the tree of life. It's very hard to see how evolution is going to explain this. Now, evolutionary biologists are very creative and they come up with lots of interesting theories. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but from my design perspective, a more reasonable interpretation of these data is that these systems did not share a common ancestor. And discontinuities like this aren't present just at the level of proteins. As I said earlier, they go all the way through the hierarchy of organisms, cell types, tissues, organ systems, body plans, development, and so forth. And I don't want to be forced to say that there's some unknown evolutionary process that will span these discontinuities. Maybe that's true. But I want the freedom to say maybe these discontinuities tell us something about the history of life and that these systems are actually independent of each other and are best explained by design. So that's where discontinuity ends up possibly telling us something about the history of life that evolution would not. That is really awesome. I like how you actually did that analogy with the different computers. That definitely helped the point come across more. Uh, we're HP users over here. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm all Mac. I'm talking to you on an iMac. I've got a MacBook. My wife unexpectedly about 11 years ago, bought me a MacBook out of the blue and I crossed the great divide from PC to Mac and I'll never go back. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have an interesting conversation uh, with my, my brother Casey. If you guys ever go head to head <laughs> PC versus <laughs> Mac. <laughs> oh, wow. That, that's pretty interesting. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on uh, a common descent. That was great. I actually would like to take us back to that same video where you contrasted intelligent design with common descent. So you said intelligent design, by contrast, it gives you an understanding of how those discontinuities came to be. Because a designer, unlike a natural process, can go to the particular functional target that he wants to make a reel and say... These cells are going to be doing a different job. They're going to need a different way to store the genetic information. They're going to be more complicated. So I'll provide them with the features they need to be a eukaryotic cell. And these prokaryotic cells will be much more simpler. So design, I think, gives you the explanatory power to deal with the actual discontinuities that we see in the biological world. And I think this is a fully testable and I think it can lead to additional knowledge. Paul, may you please give the audience an example, maybe three at least examples of how the intelligent design theory has adequately explained these discontinuities and share what knowledge was gained as a result. So what I would like to refer to is uh, something that I would encourage uh, the listeners, uh, people watching this podcast, to pursue, which is an idea I've called design triangulation. So if you Google my name and the term design triangulation, you'll pull up a very large file where uh, we don't have time today, but it lays out in detail how I see intelligent design leading to knowledge, leading to testable knowledge. Uh, no idea in science, uh, I think I can say this with some confidence, is ultimately valuable if it doesn't generate knowledge about the world, okay? And what I want intelligent design to do is to be fruitful. Again, as a Christian, I, I can uh, quote from Jesus, by, by their fruits you will know them, right? His, 
you know, he was speaking to a culture that was very agricultural. They had, uh, you know, uh, vineyards everywhere over ancient Israel. And his listeners knew that as a, as a tree grew, as a, as a vine grew, you could judge its quality by the kind of fruit that it produced. I want using that same metaphor for intelligent design to produce good fruit for humans, for, for medicine, for technology, for all the areas that we wish to understand. And design triangulation is an idea that I've been developing for about 10 years uh, that looks at the actual practice of biology. So it's much more important to me to pay attention to what scientists do, <laughs> right? On a day-to-day -day basis. What do they do when they go in their labs on Monday morning versus what they say? And it occurred to me that molecular biologists in particular, I'll use them, use them as an example, use a kind of method of analysis that presupposes design, whether they are conscious of it or not. And the triangulation metaphor works like this. We know A, we know B, all right? So these are two facts about some system that we're pretty sure of. Because we know A, because we know B, from these we can triangulate to C. We say something like C is probably true. If A is true and B is true, then the connection of those two facts with respect to some system tells us there's something like C, now we can go looking for it. So I'll give you an example. Copper is a poison. Copper ions, you do not want sloshing around your cells. It's a highly reactive metal. It can get into all kinds of positions in the cell where it creates mischief. So copper poisoning is a real problem, right? You do not want free copper sloshing around inside you. <coughs> it's a poison. That's A. Free copper is a poison. What's B? Copper is an essential cofactor in many enzymes within you, right? It occurs as a metal at the active site of the enzyme. It's involved in like an electron transport. All right, you can do this. Take A, copper is a poison. Take B, copper is an essential cofactor. You have to have it or you'll get very sick if you don't have some amount of copper in your diet. From A and B, you can triangulate to C. C is, I've done this with students many, many times. They do this in real time. I can, I can time them on my watch, right? They say, well, if that's true, Paul, there must be a system in cells that binds copy, copper, right? So it's not free moves it to where it's needed, and releases it in a controlled way. All right, look at the actual discovery of that system. What scientists did is they said, we know A, it's a poison. We know we have to have it. There's got to be a system in the cell that does this. Now we can go looking for it. That's what I call design triangulation. Why is it designed? Because to make that inference work, you have to presuppose the system as a whole. It's the system as a whole that tells you, right? I'm not working by magic. I'm working by discoverable mechanisms. You know they have to be there. You can go looking for them. But the only way you can do this is if you presuppose the system as a whole, as primary, what gives you a system as a whole? Well, design does, not bottom-up physics. Bottom-up physics is very powerful and very stupid. It does the same thing over and over. What do designers do? They say, I've got to have these diverse functions. They've got to all be jointly present at the same time for this thing to work. So I need to bring all these different parts together in just the right relationship to give me an organism. So the only, the only view of explanation that we currently have that gives us systems as a whole as causally primary is design. Everything else is naturalistic and it starts bottom up from physics. 
And that has failed. We know now so much more about cells than Darwin did. And Darwin's view was you could have a warm little pond and chemistry would give you a cell. Today, in April 2021, we know that's not true, right? And that chemistry first approach to living things has failed. So uh, I want to encourage your listeners and the people, you know, who we have in the audience, if they want to know more about this, this is the path by which, or a path, I don't want to be too immodest, a path by which intelligent design will yield knowledge, because you know what, Chris, it's doing so already. De facto, the de facto practice of molecular biologists all over the world is to use this method of inference to discover things. And one of the things I do in this very long presentation, it's well over 200 slides, is show how this works both today and in the history of biology. Uh, so we, we've run over a bit, but I have time for one other historical example that's quite striking. Harvey in the uh, uh, you know, early development of Western biology, so, sort of in the scientific revolution, William Harvey looked at theories of how blood moved around the body and at the time, Galen's theory, which I don't have time to summarize, but basically is a unidirectional blood flow. Blood comes from the liver and flows out to the tissues and somehow makes its way around the tissues and so forth. Harvey looked at that and he said, if we imagine that the heart pumps out a certain amount of blood with each beat and you calculate that, the total volume of blood pumped in a Galen type system would vastly exceed the measured volume of any animal. So he was able to, using sheep and dogs to get a, an assessment of how much blood these animals had. And he said, there's just no way that blood flow can be unidirectional because the total volume pumped will that within a short time will vastly exceed <coughs> the measured volume. So what did he do? He triangulated. He said, imagine this amount of blood being produced with each beat of the heart. We know what the actual blood volume is. It is necessary that the blood makes a circuit, right? That the blood is circulating. It's not unidirectional, it's a circular flow. And he said, this is functionally necessary for living things. And he was right. The problem was at the time, people didn't know about capillaries. So they didn't know the point at which the blood came from the arterial system and went into the venous system, which it does at the capillaries, these tiny little structures where the blood begins its route back, right? This works. It yields knowledge. It does. The history of biology, and as you'll see, if you go to this file and design triangulation, it works, it yields knowledge. But the only way it works is if you say, I need the system as a whole. Anyway, that's kind of a, 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 an advertisement for this idea of design triangulation. But the reason I'm excited about it is we know it already works. We know its connection to intelligent design, and I want a theory of design that's fruitful, that helps us solve problems in cancer, in medicine, generally speaking, that leads us to understand how memory works, how development is regulated, all these mysteries that we're currently trying to crack. I think design triangulation provides a fruitful approach. Paul? Thank you so much. We've now arrived at our final question. In an article called The Shadow of a Science Yet to be Born, it sounded like you were saying that that was the science of biological design, and that's the science that's yet to be born. So, Paul, more often than not, 
scientists who do embrace the intelligent design theory, they're peppered with questions such as what are some testable predictions from ID or even sometimes loaded questions like, uh, why do you embrace ID? That's not science, which assumes that intelligent design is not science. However, I think it would be interesting to change things up a bit and close what they call for further exploration. So, Paul, what are some questions that you might have for, say, the critics of the intelligent design theory that will help spur some productive dialogue? I think if I could focus on one area that troubles me more than anything, uh, it would be the heuristic or the approach to living things that says we don't know what it does, therefore it probably does nothing. I can't imagine a worse philosophy for learning about life. Um, it comes, I, I would say, and I hope this doesn't come across as too harsh, but it comes from a hubris or a misplaced pride in our own understanding. We don't make living things. We find them as they are. And I think a much healthier, more fruitful attitude to life is to treat it with the respect that it deserves, that every living thing is in a sense a miracle. Um, you know, my wife got me to enjoy gardening a few years ago. And now go out in the backyard. And right now we have a, the tulips are up and the daffodils are up. And, you know, they'll be around for a few weeks and then they, you know, the flower fades and so forth. But if you look at the structure of angiosperm flowers, uh, uh, this is a grown up audience and I can be grown up. Those are the sexual parts of an angiosperm. You know, our designer, our creator was not a prude. He made the sexual parts of higher plants the most beautiful things we can imagine. So I see this daffodil, right? The flower part of the plant and the exquisite change in the structures of, as it's coming up out of the ground, you have differential expression of of developmental information in higher plants where the plant in effect says, okay, now I need to build my flower. I'm gonna change color. I'm gonna change structure. All of that is as, as the developing plant is coming up out of the ground, it's differentially expressing its genetic information. So that if I take a cell from the flower part of a daffodil and compare it to the cell in the green part, right? The plant, as it's coming up through the ground, the same DNA will be in those cells, yet they look different. And the reason they look, di they look different is there's a controlling logic in the development of the plant that says, now you're gonna make this beautiful yellow flower and it will have the reproductive cells that will enable another generation of daffodils, right? Uh, and that's true for all the plants in my backyard, that, that they are expressing their information in ways that are coherent and rational. And I, I, you know, I, I want to say to a, an evolutionary biologist, treat living things with the respect and admiration that they deserve. <laughs> Don't have the hubris to say, well, that's junk DNA. It doesn't do anything. Or I don't know what that structure does. So it's an evolutionary vestige. Um, you know, we can talk uh, as, as Christians about high and low views of scripture, right? Where a low view of scripture says, oh, it was written by a bunch of crazy people thousands of years ago. And most of it doesn't make any sense. A few little bits of it do. That's a low view of scripture. A high view of scripture says, this was revealed to us. Prophets inspired by the Holy Spirit wrote this down for our benefit. And there are levels of meaning here that we have only begun to, to grasp. So I take a high view of living things and say, I, I'm not going to approach them with the misplaced pride 
that I think misleads evolutionary theory. I'm going to approach them and say, I don't make flowers. I find them as they are. And I need to give them the respect that they deserve because that will lead me to greater understanding and greater knowledge. So when I thought about this question that you sent me, I thought, you know, there's one thing that if I could change, that's what I would change. I would encourage biologists to approach living things as the miracles that they are. And they, <laughs> the living things, if I could personify them, they will honor you for doing that and open up knowledge to you that if you give them the right attitude, they'll reward you by saying, and now you're going to see this part of me and understand this part of me that's very subtle, that's very elegant, that reveals design. So it, I think if I could change one thing, it would be that deep attitude towards life and the respect that it deserves. Paul, that was a very, very beautiful answer. And thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute joy. Thank and you. And, yeah. And um, I don't know how you guys uh, provide information to your listeners in terms of follow-up, but if anyone wants to follow up with me uh, about any of the topics in this uh, in this uh, discussion, they can contact me, Care of the Discovery Institute. Just email Discovery Institute and say, please pass this to Paul Nelson, and they will pass it on to me. And I consider myself a resource person that uh, I like to give people more information at a deeper level if that's what they're interested in. So please feel free to email Discovery Institute. Just go to their webpage. You'll find the contact address, email address, and say, please pass this to Paul Nelson, and then I'll be put in touch with you. And that's a good way to, to get in touch with me if you want to follow up on any topic. Thank you so much for offering that. I mean, I really appreciate that. I know I learned so much uh, from this presentation, and I know many other listeners can say the same thing. And to our listeners... Thank you so much for taking the time to learn with us on the Current Topics in Science podcast, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. You can find Dr. Nelson's biographical information, his video lectures, his articles, and several of the things that he mentioned in the description. Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.